Hello, everyone. This is Trip, and I'm here with my friend Thomas J. Ord um, because, uh, you know, we just made this giant 10 video series, theor significantly shorter than our normal conversations, Tom. You know, these are True. more like 30 minute videos, uh, all built for everyone to tackle uh, questions, conversations around God after deconstruction, which also inspires this thing. Hey, Yay. look at that. It's physical. It's physical. <laughs> um, and uh, so we've been doing, we not only made this video series, which everyone can go grab at godafterdeconstruction.com, along with links to go get the book, uh, hang out with us at um, some events and such. Uh, but we've been collecting questions and things from people uh, that have been going through the video series and reading the book and then uh, inviting uh, different friends on to hang out with us. And today we're joined by Brian Recker, who's a uh, Instagram celebrity. You know, that's uh, I, I, no, I reject that. I reject that. But at the same time, you know what? If it gets me in the room talking to you cool guys, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, maybe before we before we jump into the questions you got people sent in and such, uh, you want to kind of introduce yourself to people, especially those that. Uh, you know, normally listen on the podcast and stuff like that. And they're like, well, what's an Instagram and, and who is this guy? What is an Instagram? Indeed, a TikTok. Um, so my name is Brian Recker. I was a evangelical pastor uh, for about eight and a half years. And I began deconstructing. Well, I probably began deconstructing while still a pastor with the rise of Trump in 2015, but I formally resigned in 2020. I think that the pause of COVID was sort of the space that I needed to see things clearly, my life, what I was a part of, the fact that I was on the wrong side of history and needed to make a radical change. Um, and so I resigned in 2020, um, took some time where I just didn't really do anything and tried to figure out you know, who I am and what, what, what I was doing with my life. And then I just started sharing publicly about my deconstruction journey about a year ago on Instagram and, you know, a lot of folks resonated with it. So I've just been continuing to, to share that journey. Um, and now I'm writing a book on hell. So that's me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just writing a book on hell. It leads to large amounts of uh, bad dreams, right? Normal. Uh, you just think it through all the ways the Bible testifies to eternal conscious torment. Yeah. Like, so listen, I wanted to deconstruct everything except for hell. I was like, we got to hold on to that. Got to hold on to something. To you know, as I want to let go of everything, but as long as the people I don't like burn forever, that's no, I'm just, I'm just kidding, it's the opposite. It's it's really my book is going to be about how belief in hell fundamentally corrupts Christian spirituality, making it impossible to love God, yourself and your neighbor. And the fact that for many evangelicals, although certainly progressive and mainline Christians have had ways of talking about the Christian life and the, the work of Jesus without hell for a long time. For many evangelicals, once you take hell out of the equation, they're like, why does any of this matter? What's the point of Jesus? What's the point of the cross? How, what, what does it even mean to be a Christian? Does it even matter to be a Christian? Why does any of this matter? Because fear and punishment was the foundation of their spirituality. There is no positive vision for spirituality in evangelicalism once you remove the fear and punishment. And so I'm going to hopefully help people reconstruct a positive spirituality on the other side of deconstructing belief in eternal conscious torment. Yeah. Well, Tom, you ever, you ever met anyone with that problem? <laughs> yeah. Many of the people we talk to in the surveys and we've known in our lives, I have wrestled with the hell issue. I, when, when Brian was talking, I was in my mind immediately went to a, a lecture I was giving one time. And, and at the end, you know, part of the lecture, I talked about no hell and this guy stood up in the back and basically said what Brian was saying, but it wasn't, you know, he wanted Hitler to go to hell. That was important. Mm. But also he wanted there to be consequences for negative action. And like, I was with him on that. Like, I, I do think there have, we live in a world in which sometimes there, at least there are negative consequences. It's just that we've taken that and foisted that into the afterlife and used that as a threat to quote, keep ourselves and other people in line. Mm-hmm. While we're on the topic, and I've got two such smart people right here in front of me, I, I would love to know, okay, Th Thomas, so I agree with everything you just said. So what would you say, where, where is Hitler right now, in your opinion, <laughs> your best guess? Um, and if there are not those eternal consequences, what, what do you say about the fact that, yes, there are 
consequences in this life for bad behavior, but not always, right? A lot of times people get away with it. What do you, how do you make sense of that? Yeah. I like to say that anytime we choose not to do the loving thing God has called us to do, there are natural negative consequences. God doesn't punish us, you know, send a tornado or whatever, but there are natural negative consequences. But it's not sometimes those consequences don't lay most heavily on the perpetrator. It lays most heavily upon other people. And that's the case because we live in an interrelated universe. And what we do not only has an effect upon ourselves, but upon others. So I think there are natural negative consequences to to uh, choosing other than love in any particular moment. I just think we have in the afterlife continual choices and God never gives up on anybody. So there's the hope that everyone will eventually cooperate with that, with love. Uh, but there's not a guarantee like, I mean, some universalists have a, an omnipotent God who's going to you know, make sure in the end everyone bows and does what God wants. I don't believe in an omnipotent God, but I do think the power of persuasive love just might eventually win out. And that means when it comes to Hitler, I have the hope that Hitler has seen the errors of his past and actually become conformed to the image of Christ, to use biblical language. What do you think of that, Brian? I, I'm into it. I, I, I would probably, so do you don't call yourself a universalist then, would you say? I don't. Or is it yeah, hopeful? Because, would you say a hopeful universalist? Yeah, I can say that. My, okay. The label I like from my view is relentless love. Yes. But be, because universalism is usually tied these days to either Karl Barth or David Bentley Hart, and I don't like either of their versions, I got my own language. <laughs> what don't you like about David Bentley Hart's book? I, I, I've read, well, I recently reread That Also Be Saved. I read it when it came out and I just reread it. And other than it being very difficult to read because that man is just hard to, like, I don't know, maybe you guys, again, you're smarter than me. Books like that, Diamond Doesn't. I like have to reread every paragraph three times, but a lot of brilliance in there. Where would you depart from, from his position? Yeah, I've got a number of problems with David's views. One is that he doesn't believe in a relational God. He de denies passability. Another is I think he's a compatibilist, which in philosophy means that you somehow God is in control, but we have free will. And I don't think that works. So I'm a, I am believe in genuine free will. But in terms of the afterlife, I think David has a view that God from the beginning created something out of nothing and did so in such a way that it was going to be guaranteed at the end, everything would be complete. And I think that kind of view of things really undermines the genuine freedom and also the notion that our choices really matter, you know, um, everlastingly. And I, I'm into the our choices matter. So it seems like the real departure is that he's he's simply not an open <laughs> he doesn't have the truth. <laughs> well, that maybe I, I, I'm fascinated by open and relational theology. It's somewhat new for me. I have not been in that world um, that was off limits to study when I was an evangelical yeah. pastor. And even though I flirted with more progressive views, certainly that one was um, that's that's something that I've begun to look to more and more. So. Um, yeah, fa fascinating to to think about the ever the the afterlife from an open perspective that that openness continues um, into the future, which maybe makes it less like to to hear that you're not a full universalist is, is was a little surprising to me, but that is in line with, I guess, that sense of freedom that that comes with that. But would you not say though that any that at some point, given enough time, people will turn to the good or? that God would have created us to ultimately see the good for what it is. I, I, I hope that's the case. I just don't, when people say it's guaranteed, I think, well, really is free will, uh, is, is the outcome of free will always guaranteed? I don't think so, or even ever guaranteed. Um, another way to put it is this, Brian, if God truly has the omnipotent power to guarantee that everyone will choose God in the afterlife, why doesn't God use that power to stop the crap that happens right now in our lives and in the world? And because God doesn't, I have to hope that God doesn't have controlling power because otherwise God's doing a piss poor job of things given God's abilities. And that just doesn't sound appealing to me. So it does extend the logic of what's happening now then into the future. 
which right. does that does trouble me about my the view that I have been most at home in, which is a universal reconciliation view. Um, one of the issues with that is, yeah, why wait, right? Why why is yeah. it bad now and it's just good then? Um, what does that say about God? Is this all just like a test? Like, what is you know, what's the point of this? It starts to feel a little bit arbitrary and silly um, yes. to allow that stuff right now. Why are you convinced that there's an afterlife at all? Well, uh, first of all, I should say part of what we say in this book is I'm not certain of practically much at all, but um, I lean toward there being continued subjective experience in the afterlife, in large part from near-death experiences, that literature, out-of-body experiences. And of course, there's a literature not only in the Christian tradition, but in various traditions. So, you know, I don't hang my hat on that view, but it is a part of what I think is at least plausible. And then I kind of extend the logic of uncontrolling love into the afterlife and say, well, if we don't have these bodies, but we continue to have subjective experiences, we have some kind of freedom in that to choose well or poorly in relation to God's offerings of love. Anything to add, Trip? And you just like, <laughs> oh, kind of just ran with this baby. <laughs> I'm just killing it. <laughs> oh, well, I, I, I would say. There are two things that I would add. One is um, just around the relationship of freedom and love. Like if the goal is genuine loving relations, then the moment there's an absence of freedom, then there's an absence of love. And not all, not all Christian theologians have thought like they're required, you know, both to be there for it to happen. But like when it goes to um, the history of the church, I mean, I think this is something uh, Origen, uh, early church father. Uh, emphasize quite a bit. He wrote the first systematic theology, at least the only one, you know, the earliest one we have. Um, and in it, he said, you know, there's, here are a few of the basic apostolic teachings. And in his mind, these are like what everyone before him believed. And so he's just kind of like reporting and then he's going to work it out. And one is that God, God is love and desires loving relations. Uh, uh, love requires freedom. Right. And so this leads him over the course of on first principles, his, uh, his theology, to go, well, yeah, like God is unrelenting in love. Like we were created to be in relationship, uh, to be known and to know oneself as uh, as created by, known by, and loved by God. Um, but given love requires reciprocity, then freedom's an essential element. Um, and if if the vision of of you know eternal love uh, that would still require that kind of freedom. Um, but th so the problem, uh, in that is like, if you're keeping freedom is that the problem aren't the people, the problem are the things that warp and pollute, toxify, uh, the, the kind of the pain and suffering one may have and all these kinds of things that shape or rework our freedom. So, um, you, and you can see why he gets this right out of Paul, right? What's being conquered isn't like the bad people. It's sin, law, and death, like the things that uh, uh, overdetermine our relationships. So we don't recognize, honor, and celebrate the um, our neighbors, or even our enemies, or our non-human neighbors. Right? The the the, mm. the kind of cornucopia of living relations that we're gifted uh, in creation. Um, and so I think that freedom side uh, is there, and that leads him to go like, well, I, who knows? I mean, maybe and Satan gets saved. And later he goes, well, well, you might have universal reconciliation, but what happens if that freedom gets used like in, in resisting again? Well, he said there might be a whole nother, you know, fall from the Round divine two. and then God redeems everyone again. Right? So, and, and, wow. and, but here's, here's why I think it's helpful is the, his non-negotiables are that love and freedom are intertwined yep. and his other non-negotiable is that God is precisely the one who loves and freedom and will pursue even if it's Satan or if we fell multiple times, right? Like, and those are all like, like beyond imagination, like the idea of talking about things we have very little access to is hard, but for theologians. And I think for Christians in general, it's like, where, where do you plant your foot and planting your foot in love seems to be a surprisingly conservative move for Christians, right? Like, it, it, you know, when John says God is love, it doesn't say, well, God is love, except, on the backside, then, then that's right. where the wrath comes out right. or in, in this kind of thing. And so 
I, I think that relationship of freedom and love is there. And then like yeah. how you imagine it, what is the question you're asking? Um, and, and when it goes to, uh, when, when it goes to the question of the afterlife in general, I think Tom was pointing towards kind of like the kind of phenomena that if you take seriously might postulate it based on kind of like empirical reflection on these type of experiences. Theologically, I think um, for Christians, like if if there's not something beyond this existence, then Jesus identifying God as Abba is a contested uh, term. If Jesus dies, abandoned, cross dead, a failed Messiah, then why would we expect the rest of people that bear crosses in history to turn out better? Right, like part of the afterlife. And where it emerges in Second Temple period Judaism, right? Because most the, the history of this, if you read scripture, there's not lots of people believing in the afterlife till it gets to the end of the Hebrew scriptures in the New Testament. But the the belief in it uh, emerges not because they needed people to get sorted and judged. It's so that how does there end up being one good God of creation? It that only happens if. Those who die cross dead, abandon. If those who suffer injustice have a future in the life of God that sin, law, and death can't take. Um, and so for me, the resurrection of Jesus, the you know, last week on Theology and Throwdown, there's a long talk about what I mean by it, but the part of that statement is to say in faith that the God who is present in Christ is present in history and gives a future. Uh, to all those who die cross dead. And it's that is required in some sense for us to end up saying something like God is love in a world of injustice, suffering, and brokenness. That is required to say something that the God, that God was revealed in Christ. Um, because if his own Basically, end Brian, was you got the end, preaching now. You got him preaching. Now. Well, <laughs> if that was the end, I, I think then, I just got saved again. I think it worked. Well, I don't know how you get people so, to walk down the aisle on a live stream, Brian, but I'm just really glad your intro lasted 18 minutes, you know? <laughs> well, I, I want to um, just, be, I'm curious how you deal with a few verses in light of kind of having the openness on the other side of death and less of a sure universalism, but more of a, a potential for universalism what you would say to the the verses like, you know, for instance, in Ephesians 1, where it talks about um, the plan for the fullness of time is to gather up all things in him, things in heaven on earth, or in Colossians 1, where it says, um, you know, that uh, pleased to reconcile to himself all things. So all the kind of reconcile all things in heaven and on earth, God might be all in all. Those feel like universal promises of where it will land. What do you, how do you wrestle with those? I, well, the, I rest. Oh, go for it. Go ahead and trip. Oh, I was just gonna. I was just gonna say those are a, a plan. Is not a is not a, a script. They're different. Um, and if freedom is required for it, then and we have we cooperate and participate, then it's not settled. It can be a plan. It can be one that the infinite God of infinite love pursues recklessly and tirelessly, despite how many you know uh, setbacks and, and such that are there. Um, and then in the all make all things new line in Revelation, right? The like the, the the making of all things new is is precisely a, an activity, right? The making all things new. So God's last line in Scripture in the First Corinthians fifteen verse you echoed there, like God being all in all, it happens when right all things sin, law, and death, the principalities, powers, the things that limit. Uh, our relations become subject to the Son, the Son to the Father, and then it says God is all in all, right? And so, like in even in that description, you see a uh, participatory um, vision, right? Like God can God can give all of God's self moment to moment, uh, but until it's received, um, like they like we we can't. God intends to do it. God right. is committed to doing it, but God can't do it on God's on God's own. Right. And so yeah. like even that Pauline passage of all in all um, that in particular, like take Gregory of Nyssa in, in the early church, right? Like he, he thought that meant uh, post-mortem 
reworking of one's soul and orientation. He didn't think like, oh, some people got set aside and these others did. Right? Like part of even the early church, the universalists in the early church, like um, like Origen or Gregory of Nyssa, Nazianzus, these individuals, uh, like post mortem existence uh, was it was assumed, but it was also still pedagogical part of coming to know oneself and participate in the divine life. And so like a purpose is different uh, than a script. Yeah. Tripp said very well what I was going to try to say, or at least the gist of it. Yep. Thanks. And, and then where are the people now that aren't yet having made that choice? Right. Like, let's say Hitler hasn't been wooed. Hitler is still unconvinced. He's still on the fence. Where is he? Yeah. So this is where obviously we have to do a lot of speculation. Like, is there a place with golden streets somewhere in the clouds? I highly doubt it. Is it on another planet? Uh, is that person at the center of the year, earth? All these location questions, you know, we're guessing. I actually wonder if, and here I'm going through wild speculation. So, you know, my hat doesn't hang on this. Please, but I wonder. All I like. I love that. <laughs> all I, like. I wonder if there's something to the view we find in many indigenous communities and in the Old Testament and the Hebrew scriptures that there are particular places where you can have closer connection to those who have gone before. So whatever it continues to exist beyond bodily death, let's just say it's the mind, that the mind is still in some geographical location on the planet. I guess it theoretically could go on other planets, but it can't be omnipresent. And in fact, those minds may in fact have some influence on us, just as we might have some influence on them. That's, again, wild speculation, but you ask, where are they? So, <laughs> so like a thin place. Something yeah, like yeah, yeah. That's the, the way we often talk about locations on earth where we feel like there's something more beyond God's presence being everywhere. There's some reality interaction, perhaps with the saints, the mothers and fathers and those who have come before. I got no problem with that way of thinking. Well, do you have a problem with, um, well, how, do you think that w being reconciled to God likely includes the maintaining your personality and your your ego your your individual uh self or do you think that there's possibility to believe that it is more of a loss of self and being joined to a universal all things picture yeah of there's differences of opinion in the open relational community on this i'm really strongly on the side that you stay you contain can, can you continue to have a self or ego I don't like this language of like you blend in or fuse into God so that you no longer have a self, but some people do. For me, again, what Tripp said earlier about love being primary, it seems like love requires real relations. And there can't be real relations if two things dissolve into one another and they become entirely one. So there's got to be some sort of differentiation for love to occur. And I think that continues in the afterlife. Do you think that there's room for that kind of belief within Christianity? Or would you say that that's yes. more outside of Christian thought? I think there is. I'm just not attracted to it. Okay. I have a pretty loose view of who's in Christianity, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, he has to keep himself in. Yeah, <laughs> I thought we were. I thought that's what we were going to do on this podcast: is make a list and you know figure out who our the new heretics are. <laughs> who's in? Oh uh, yeah. The uh, one of the one of the things um, that uh, and I was having a conversation with a rather noted theologian about this, it, who's not in a doesn't really come from a kind of process relational uh, framework. Um, but they, they said that they had all these questions right around, um, the identity, uh, around like personal identity in the afterlife. And they're like, well, I don't know about this, but they believe in God. Right. And this is, and I just said, well, I don't, to me, it seems like God's a lot bigger of a, like God is a lot bigger. I'm much more. I have a lot more questions and wrestling about the reality of God, but if there's a, if there is a God, the idea of post-mortem existence doesn't seem that complicated. 
um, for people in a process relational framework and in, in general, like every moment happens, God receives all of it into God's self. Um, and the kind of step one for process people is like God, everything's objectively immortal in the life of God. Like every moment that happens, God knows it. Um, and, and then the question of like subjective immortality, like one's own continued existence where you're the seat of your own experience. Um, the, like the moment you see the self as a series of events where you're the experiencing center and that God knows it completely for it to have another seat of subjectivity, some other time, like a place where, uh, it exists, like, well, well, wouldn't it lose it? Right. That's kind of, it, it's just there. Um, and so, um, in scripture, you get all these different images like, oh, well, like a spiritual body or, and, 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 you know, it plays off these notions of star bodies and, and it, it, in all that sitting there, I'm just saying that the, the concept of the afterlife, if God has received all of creation moment to moment, then God contains the, the fullness of who you are in a way that you can't even receive in this moment. So if God knows it and holds it, the idea that it would engage in possibility again, receive, have another moment of becoming, that's not a very complicated feat. Um, that makes the, sense. I, I think where I like sometimes go is so much of our personalities are constructed socially as defense mechanisms, you know, layers of ego and false self in order to be seen by others and appreciated by others. And it seems to me that in eternity, all of that would be stripped away to the the divine core, true self. And at that point, I wonder how much how much of our personalities remain, especially if you're talking about like a, a bad person, um, like when when Hitler is made fit for eternity. Is he even Hitler at that point? Like, is he even the same guy? Because so much of who he was, everything he said, everything that he did, his whole personality was so false. Um, and, and then in that sense, at that point, are we more just united and, and more of a core well, divine self? I mean, here, here, open and relational thinkers, at least some of them, uh, have some commonalities with Buddhism insofar as uh, Buddhists talk about no self. And open and relational folks usually want to talk about a self as a series of moments. And because each moment then can be altered or use more biblical language transformed. Yes, the self of trip in this moment is not the same of, tri of trip a year ago in the sense of being some sort of substance that says the same through time. So we can say about Hitler in one sense, he's not the same person. None of us are the same person we used to be. But because there's a continue uh, continuation, uh, continual subjective experience is the, is the technical way to talk about it. What can change then is realistic, not only for you and me, but for Hitler. And the future uh, selves of Hitler in this chain can really be Christ-like because of the change over time. I love that we're just talking about like the cha the transformation into Christ likeness of Adolf Hitler. That's been the <laughs> that's been the focus. Uh, are, are we supposed to talk about deconstruction? Should I, yeah. should I shift the conversation? No, I know the, I, this whole session is about helping you write your next book. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I I find these questions really interesting. Hopefully, other people do because I will say like we in evangelicalism. Here's how we'll tie it into deconstruction. There was not, you are not allowed to be curious in the way that I've been curious right now in evangelicalism. For me to ask like anything other than the, the kind of heavenly picture, like you mentioned, of the streets of gold and we're all just with God for eternity and then the damned are in hell, like that was the picture. And to ask other questions about what it could possibly look like was seen as really boundary pushing. And so for some people, it is probably liberating just to be able to think about that stuff and you're not immediately just out of the camp um, by having these thoughts. And the fact that, you know, you could even say, yeah, if you have a more Buddhist sense of, you know, uniting like a drop into the ocean on the other side, like that doesn't mean that you can't call yourself a Christian. Like that people have differences of opinion on, on what the nature of the afterlife is. That's very liberating. Yeah. And, and I would say the, uh, you can usually tell what kind of, uh, what part of the church you're in as to whether you ask Hitler questions or Gandhi ones. <laughs> right. I love like it. A, That's like, an... like the, the, if you're, if afterlife is like the legitimation of your authoritarian kind of justice, then you ask Hitler questions. 
if you, the afterlife kind of just freaks you out and you need God to be multi-religious, then you ask the Gandhi question. <laughs> um, I feel like there's, there's gotta be a, uh, um, which question do you like better? What, what's your, well, I, like, I, I, I haven't really personally lost sleep on either of them for quite a long time, but I just knowing, like, if you show up, I'm sure Tom has this, when you go guest speak somewhere, whichever one gets first, which gets asked first, you know what you're working with. Mm -hmm. Um, but you, the other part, I, some of the things I found uh, is, uh, like when you ask questions and there's going to be all these things connected to your identity within the church you're in and these anxieties you have in these questions, sometimes reframing it and asking a follow-up to ask from a different place, uh, helps because there's going to be like five sermons, different ministers said to you in your head over here, like worried that your Sunday school teacher is going to fill this over here. Um, and so like, like even just ask, well, if Jesus asked us to pray for our enemies, at what point does he stop? You know, like um, that is it a, a you you see like like sometimes when we ask the wrong question we get really bad theology answers and if we ask different questions other ones come up because underneath the the command to disciples pray for your enemies uh, is a different vision of what how you see the enemy how God sees the enemy and what is it like to relate to your enemy as Christ calls us to. Well, it's pers like the moment you identify one, you now have an obligation to pray for them. You have an obligation to love for them, love them. If that's what it, Jesus is inviting his disciples to do, how odd would it be that the one who is the image of the invisible God, our Savior and Lord, is inviting us into that because his dad's an asshat, right? And, like they're <laughs> and to and to deeply understand how they got where they are, and that's. You know, Jesus, my probably my favorite statement of Jesus uh, of enemy love was father, forgive them for they, they don't know what they're doing. That to me is such radical empathy that he's able to see, of, of course, they would do this. I know how they've been indoctrinated. I know how they've been raised. I know the violence that has been done to them. Of course, this this way of living and behaving makes sense based on the experiences that, that they've had. Um, and also the finite minds that they have, right? That they can't see the end from the beginning, which is why I, I do kind of, that is an attractive aspect of universalism to me is that when we're freed from some of those constraints, I would hope that um, even Hitler, you know, if, we, we, if I truly believe that everyone is not, I don't believe in original sin, I believe in original goodness. I don't believe that at the very core we're evil. I believe at the very core there is divinity, there is image of God. And that means that there is hurt, there are wounds, there are traumas, there's also mental illness. There are, there are the pains that make you want to bring pain out on others. There, there are just limitations in our finiteness that have made us do bad things. And I would hope that an infinite God would have that ability to say, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing, and ultimately lead us to that place of saying yes to the good. Because it is not the divinity in us, the image of God in us that rejects the good. It is all the false stuff that, that we've developed in our lives. I want to jump in here, Brian, because I, I love this line of conversation, and you've mentioned a few words that are really important to me, and one of them is forgiveness. But just to kind of step back and and look at this through this lens of deconstruction that we're supposed to be working on here. Um, you know, I think a lot of people, myself included, came from a background in which it was really important to have the right set of beliefs, these certain propositions about God, the afterlife, how we ought to live. And usually there's a long list. And if you're really mature, you know what those are and, you know, you can defend them really well. Um, and then what happens is people start to see the problems with individual propositions or beliefs or tenets on that list. And then they start just uh, realizing there's problems with others. And pretty soon it's like, OK, it, there's there's problems here and they deconstruct. Sometimes what people do is they go from the list of propositions to, well, it's all just absolute mystery. They go rightly go from thinking that faith is all about having convictions and certainty about these propositions to, hey, anything matters. It's just mystery. And as Tripp knows, I really object strongly to the absolute mystery. <laughs> and I think one of the hallmarks of open relational thinking in general is that people in our community, when we see a tension between two ideas, Instead of just kind of throwing up and say, well, who knows, doesn't matter, we tend to want to try to work in that tension to try to overcome it in some way. 
So take the most probably well-known, the tension between God's power and God's love when it comes to evil. Well, open and relational folks are really well known for thinking, okay, we're going to privilege God's love and rethink God's power in light of that. Now, we don't all agree on how exactly that works, but the general notion that we're going to privilege one and understand the others in light of it. So when it comes to for the afterlife, one of the persons one of the, in our chat brought up the question of God's justice. And I think we have this tension in traditional thought between God's justice somebody's got to pay, and God's love and forgiveness. And generally speaking, open and relational folks say, no, we're going to privilege forgiveness. And then we're going to try to understand justice, whatever that means, in light of that. And that then can lean us toward either universalism, hopeful universalism, relentless love. Some people are annihilationists, but something about that love and forgiveness comes first. Yeah. I, I love that. I think it's good to acknowledge our biases, but it's like if everybody's going to have a bias, let's have a bias for the good thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like you can't get away from from having a bias. So I'll I'll go with the good one. Yeah. Um, I, I have a question just to kind of zoom back out to the deconstruction thing. I know we've kind of been in the afterlife space for a little while, and I totally um, apologize for that. And also thank you for. Well, it does me. show up in three chapters, Brian. The, <laughs> like the, the, there's a reason it comes up. Like oh, well, around yeah. divine power, it comes up around church abuse. It comes up right uh, towards the end. I can't remember. Oh, well, religious, religious, religious pluralism chapter. Right. Uh, the question of the afterlife, like if if the conclusion of uh, if the conclusion of God's big story uh, ends with God having enemies and taking names eternally, then God's it's story. really hard to put it in the in, in a book called Good News. Well, I, I think it comes <laughs> up a lot, too, because the evangelicalism that many of your listeners, many of us in America were raised in, the afterlife was the point of the Christian life end of the Christian message, end of the life of Jesus Christ, the whole thing. Because when, when something as dramatic as hell is in the room, it kind of sucks the air out of the room. Like how could good deeds really in this <laughs> life matter that much if the people we're doing the good deeds for are going to burn, not for like the length of their existence in, in earth, but like for eternity, then actually nothing else matters except getting them out of hell. So it tends to become a motivating priority. And as a result, I, I think, for a lot of people when they're like, wait, wait, hell's not a thing. Why should I care about any of this then? You know, so that I, I do think it's important, but I, I want to ask you guys about your view on deconstruction though, because I, um, and I think a lot of people began my deconstruction more recently than you did with the, the rise of Trump was like a big wake up call for me that made me realize. And the, the question really, or the, the thing that dropped into my heart with Trump was, oh my God, if the people that I've been trusting for theological, like wisdom, can't see through this, then they have a real discernment issue. And what else have they been lying to me about? Right. And that kind of started things for me. But Tripp, I love how in your story, you had some of those same realizations, not around Trump, but around like the Iraq war. So we're going way back. You started seeing stuff. So as you've seen sort of wave after wave over the last 20 years, what's happening right now? Do you feel like this is just another wave of something that's always happening? Or do you feel like a bigger shift is happening? Huh. I mean, I think uh, it's similar, right, in the sense that my experience then, right, I went to college at a Baptist school because I was a Baptist preacher's kid. You always are at a church where they would hire your parent, right? Like this is how that works. So you just kind of assume the when you meet other Baptist preachers that do stuff with your family and your church planning and you you interact with lots of your tribe. I didn't realize I was at a Baptist school that we were the uh, uh, as big in the minority um, as as we because were. Because you were raised a liberal Baptist. Yeah, like uh, it, like we always had um, like it, like there was never an argument about like can women do something. Um, my my dad was very aggressive on r race stuff. Uh, the it, it, when I was little little, uh, one of the earliest memories I have is a KKK burning a cross. Um, in our churchyard after dad did a interracial marriage in rural North Carolina. And they were like, this isn't good. Um, and, and he, he was part of starting what was then called the Baptist AIDS partnership, which was for people with HIV AIDS and their caretakers at a time where, you know, this was before the cocktail where it was 
The health situation for people with HIV is very dire and they're being ostracized, fear mongered and everything. So if you're little and you're like, Jesus loves everybody and blah, 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 and this kind of thing, and you're having experiences uh, where the church is what's calling you forward on particular justice issues, then it's not until I get to college in the second, my sophomore year at the beginning of the years, 9-11, and then seeing the amount of uh, I love Jesus, let's go to war. I love Jesus, Islamophobia. I love Jesus, this kind of thing. Um, and the, you know, later when we first started bombing and there was an eruption of clapping in the dorm, uh, that to me was just like, what, wow. what, what's going on? Um, and it, so, so like t- the, to me, there was this, uh, you, you know, there's one, there's one thing to be like, I have to confess my sins because there's so many ways just being in a middle-class American, you're complicit in all sorts of things. Uh, filling out my taxes, I sadly did the math and realized that, you know, I, I spent $9,000 on the military industrial complex this year. Um, that's more than I gave out of the rest of my money to feed someone. So what does that make me? But there, there's a whole nother thing from like even acknowledging your brokenness and connection and the way you're wedded to systems, confessing it and working to do better. And then leveraging the cross and the flag at the same time, as you demonize other religious neighbors and go to war and it's tangentially related at best. Um, and, and so that was, uh, in that I didn't end up breaking up with God as much as what's the point of the church kind of thing. Like what are we even doing? That description you gave earlier of why am I trusting these people? If this happened, it was kind of, am I, do I really want to be a part of this community or maybe my family was just the exception. Um, And I think now uh, since then, think of how many people have exited American evangelicalism Mm. uh, for tons of other reasons. So who was left? Um, Like there was a time that all the Christian schools had Tony Campolo and Jim Wallace come preach every year. Mm -hmm. There was a time where they tolerated open theists. There was a time, (laughs) like if you start going through kind of think of it like a stew and you've now boiled out all these people that used to make the spectrum of possibilities there smaller and smaller so and you're in the life of the church the this the plausible structure of different ideas you could have got smaller and smaller as more people got kicked out the same thing kind of has happened culturally around political tribes uh where as especially with new media and news ecosystems algorithms all that kind of stuff people get more and more insular tribes so that when you get to Going into lockdown, like Trump happens, going into lockdown, Black Lives Matter, uh, all those things are going on, that there's just a whole bunch of people who were barely on the margins of American evangelicalism now see this eruption of ugly. And Mm -hmm. when, when you can't see yourself in the leaders of your community, or if you're one of those leaders and go, I can't even voice all of myself and stay in this community, then I, then I think it gets bigger. And I, and, and to me, it's, uh, I, I, I it's related what you just said about, uh, not being able to voice myself and say, yeah. I was that pastor the, the last like two years that I was a pastor. I had a secret Twitter account where I posted like my socialist thoughts, but I couldn't do it <laughs> as my name. It was, I had to have like a secret name to be a socialist online. I love it. <laughs> it's, it's nice to be an integrated person now on the other side of deconstruction. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. I just, I resonated with that. No, no, no. I, and so I do think they're related to answer your question. I just think, um, the, the volume of toxicity in the stew has gotten bigger. Um, on the episode that came out yesterday in the merged podcast, the kind of oral history, of the merging church movement, um, Brian McLaren observed, uh, you know, there were all these people that started gatekeeping, um, in the emerging church movement and made sure they didn't have a home in evangelicalism anymore. And he, and he's like, and he goes, I just wonder what the ones that have survived this long, do they really like what they got for doing it? Wow. Where 
um, you know, 80% of their um, congregations are infatuated with um, a morally decrepit authoritarian leader. Um, do they like it? And, and I actually know a lot of them and they don't. And now they're just even more scared to say anything. Uh, and so, Oh yeah. Yeah. It's, it it's sad. And, um, and, and I think it was right. The ongoing hearing of these stories that Tom and I would hear. And then do the uh, last year I did, a, or a year and a half ago, I did a big survey of homebrewed people and it comes up. That's what kind of inspired doing this project, making the video series. So people might be able to use it personally, but also in congregations and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. What about you, Tom? I mean, so obviously even, even the term deconstruction, it's not a new term, but I think that it's, um, it's newly being used as frequently as it's being used. I think it's popping up all of a sudden. Now it's like, it's like a genre of book and person in a sense, you know, like I'm a deconstruction guy, whereas yeah. I think it was always happening, but now it's happening more explicitly. Do you think that this is a, a new thing? Like what's your prognosis, sort of cultural diagnosis of, of what's happening and where it's going? Well, if deconstruction is understood as people losing confidence in the church or doctrines or views of God they've been given, there's always been people who've had some measure of, of deconstruction, at least in the Christian tradition, probably in other traditions as well. But I think in at least the UK, America, and some other places around the world, there's an accelerated rate of that because of the nine issues we mentioned in this book, one of them being nationalism in America and Christian nationalism. Um, and well, I'll just stop there because I think Tripp uh, addressed the, that Christian nationalism thing pretty well. So I see a, I see deconstruction as it's popularly understood as a phenomenon that is uh, present and so much more prevalent because there are so many more reasons people are questioning what they've been given. There is a lot of fear mongering around deconstruction right now. I think that in addition to the word being used more, I think evangelicals are now maybe taking it more seriously. And so obviously you guys responded a little bit to the um, uh, Alyssa Childers book, The Deconstruction of Christianity, um, where she, you know, there, there are some of these people now making their whole platform kind of being the anti-deconstruction people. Do you see any validity in some of the critiques of deconstruction? In other words, do you see dangers? Are you worried people will throw the baby out with the bathwater? Or do you think ultimately this is a good conversation, a good thing that's happening? I think I can speak for Trip in saying we are not trying to police boundaries <laughs> on this whole thing. We know some people who deconstruct and no longer believe in God, you know, they just sort of throw the towel in. And to be honest, I don't lose sleep over that because I happen to believe that God exists, a God of love, and God will always pursue. So, um, you know, whether in this life or the afterlife, uh, I do, however, and this is what this whole book is about, think that there are ways to think about God in life that make a lot better sense than either the past, the, in this case, the evangelical ideas or uh, habits and practices people are giving up, or this attempt to live without any transcendence whatsoever that's usually characterized by atheism. And that's what we're trying to, to offer here in this book. Um, so the polls, the conversations, Pew Research, all of this indicates that those people who no longer affiliate with any religious tradition, who no longer call themselves a Christian or a, a Jew or Muslim, whatever, the vast majority still believe in something like a higher power, the divine God. And so that's one of the main targets uh, for this book. Those people who have intuitions about something more that's loving, but don't really have the, the language or the framework with which to make sense of that intuition. A lot of people, like you said, are moving out of Christianity altogether as they deconstruct, either because you know, they reject it completely, or maybe even, even myself, I've wrestled with, does that label, because so many of the things that I used to believe that were, you know, a lot of the Christians that I grew up with would say, I'm not a Christian anymore, right? What, what right do I have to say, no, no, I want to stay a Christian. Um, what are your best reasons for staying Christian? Why stay Christian uh, verse, in this process of deconstruction, as you think about it? Well, my, I mean, my kind of 
the the time I wrestled most of that was really after the whole nine eleven thing, um, and it was, uh, I I would say it, you know, and that's the same time I was a philosophy major, so you every semester as you read through a different part of philosophical history or have a class on something you you know this was my fall semester as an existentialist the next semester as a post-structuralist uh <laughs> and and so um in my experience then i had lots of questions about the viability of the the part of the church i grew up in um as you get to meet other parts of it they have other challenges in different pl- in, in different places um but it was really kind of meeting, I don't know, getting to know the whole of church history and know more about the church at large that, um, like chucking the name seems odd, right? Like, um, it was, it it was actually during lockdown, Adam Clark and I did a class, um, on black theology, uh, and, and in it, one of the, one of the people in the group raised this question to, to Adam and, you know, and this, the questioner was a white boomer pastor in trouble in their congregation. Right. Uh, because half the church is like, why are you talking about this? Blah, blah, blah. And, and it had gotten difficult and, it, and, you know, and, and, and I completely get deciding not to be a part of a particular congregation and the tradition itself. But one of the things Adam said that really, I felt like named kind of an intuition was um, like, if, if you think the little slice of church history that has white American evangelicals that haven't got over slaveholder logic gets to define the entirety of the church um, and that that way you're going to walk away uh, from the one uh, who brought in the kingdom of God proclaimed it all the way to the cross and this kind of thing. The one uh, who's inspired uh, the civil rights movement in our own country is a heart of the prophetic tradition in the black church. Like he starts going through, he's like, why, like, what are you doing by handing over this whole identity of Christianity uh, to um, what you're experiencing as the most abhorrent, harmful, deformed element? Um, Yes, where you came from, uh, you, you might need to leave that. Maybe you check out of it for a while. But the idea that you're going to discuss Christianity where what is normative is uh, a an idolatrous expression that can't differentiate allegiance to an executed Savior and Lord from allegiance uh, to a you know, Christo-fascist nationalist, then like like, why do they get to define Christianity for you? Or do you have a big enough imagination to not let white supremacy tell you what Christianity is? And, and, and to me that like when he was voicing it that way, it was helpful for a lot of people in the group. And it also made me think like, I can remember times, right? The first time I read origin was in that same period where I read on first principles and I wrote my paper on him, uh, the following semester after nine 11, uh, where he's like, and here's, you know, the first systematic theology. Here's what the church has always taught. And these are just basic apostolic teachings before I get crazy, right? And talk about Satan getting saved. Um, and that kind of thing. So it's like one of the things I've kind of, I've invited, I, or I've experienced that as an invitation to, um, uh, to, to name a cancer as a cancer. But that's not what a body, a healthy body is to look like. And when you recognize something as a cancer, one, like being honest about the situation is important, figuring out how to treat and respond. It sometimes has to get cut out, sometimes has to get treated. Sometimes you find out that there are things going on in your life that you need to shift patterns to move towards greater healthiness. Sometimes like there's all these different ways of responding. But what you never do is go, well, oh, the, that tumor, that's the person. Right. Um, and I think often when we take our if we take a per, our particular experience of the church in one particular place and and universalize it so that all the other lives that have been part of the body of Christ throughout its history get essentialized into a tumor, um, then that that's kind of doing violence to quite a few beautiful souls that I wouldn't want. Uh, I wouldn't want to do. I, I love that picture. I think it's really helpful. I think the difficult thing for many of us is that Christianity in America right now, it feels like it's mostly tumor. You know, I don't know what stage of cancer this is where 
the more body is tumor than body, you know? Um, yeah, and, and so and it I is just helpful to have not not odd, history. Right? It's not odd. That happened in the life of Israel. It's happened in the life of the church before, right? So, uh, but you, but Americans are great at thinking, not only are we the exception, we're the exemplification of the true essence of anything, be it democracy, humanity, any religious tradition. Anyways, just, so um, they, and there are times complete unfaithfulness leads to genuine judgment in history and in, in the world. Like it, it's, I find it odd that people can read Kings uh, that opens right with, with Solomon um, uh, leveling up the military industrial complex, trading arms with neighbors that he was told by the prophet not to do. And then he just gets a new prophet followed by uh, coming up with new tax laws. So that a lot of uh, his own citizens are in so much debt slavery. He has them functioning as slaves, but labeled something different because that would be immoral. Uh, and then they get judged uh, that this is what happens when you act this way. Right. Like, so the, 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 it, it, it people, anyway you american get empire yeah yeah uh, awesome. yeah and maybe and maybe it needs to die i just it's just scary as a parent um that uh our kids and grandkids may be bearing the consequences of the inability for so much of the church from uh the from repenting of the internalization of slaveholder logic so i like that i think that's a really good line there that um that you said this idea that um yeah, it's it's the group of people. I have noticed. I recently I recently reread Kelly Brown Douglas's the the Black Christ. It's a, it's a classic uh, book, and in the first couple chapters, she contrasts the White Christ and the Black Christ. The White Christ of the slaveholders. It's primarily about believing the right things about Jesus to go to heaven instead of hell when you die, versus the Black Christ of the enslaved, which was a, a Christ who was in solidarity with them, who went to the marginalized. It was about the life of Jesus and the, the love of Jesus and what Jesus did, not just believing the right things about Jesus. And what I was struck by after reading that was, oh, the Christ of evangelicalism is still the white Christ of the slaveholders, not not the Christ of, of the enslaved. Um, and so you're right, that's who's defining uh, Christ for people in many ways. And so I do think it's important for us to not be quiet and say there are other ways of looking at this, especially because Christianity is such an influential force in, in our country and really in the world. It's still the majority religion in the world. And so we want it to be good. That's good for the world, right? Uh, and I love this book because so I think that the idea of open relational theology is helpful for people that are in this tender spot of having been rocked with deconstruction. They're questioning a lot of the assumptions. And it does seem to me that that could be a moment where they might reconsider some base principles like God knows everything and controls everything, for example. Why is it that you think that this kind of theology is so um, difficult to find in churches, even progressive ones? Mm. Like people are probably not going to encounter this if they just even pop into their, like, I, I, you know, people ask me, where can I find a good church? And I'm like, well, you know, there's some online resources. Church Clarity will help you find one that's affirming and that sort of thing. That's usually a good place to start. But even then, they may receive pictures of God that still don't work for various reasons. Yeah. I think part of it has to do, there's probably a lot of answers to that question, Brian. But uh, the first one that comes to mind is that a lot of people that I know in mainline churches, at least ones who have transferred to those churches in recent years, maybe not those who grew up in that tradition, but those who have transferred, oftentimes they're running away from crap and uh, more conservative uh, church or denominations. And I think sometimes mainline people uh, know that they don't want to bring up trigger words and trigger ideas. And so sometimes, and this is a general statement, there's exceptions, but sometimes the theology is pretty thin in, in some mainline traditions. And what they really excel at are issues related to social justice, queer issues, Black Lives Matter, et cetera. And that becomes the thing that unifies the congregation, what we're going to do. But thinking about doing the tough work of thinking about who God is and these conundrums, these tensions that have uh, been at the center of Christian, at least the traditional Christianity for a long time, those oftentimes get set aside by saying, oh, it really doesn't matter why God doesn't stop suffering in the world. We just need to get out there and be God's hands and feet and stop it ourselves. 
And that works for some people. It doesn't work for me. I mean, I do want to stop evil, but I also want to ask the question, well, if God is really omnipotent, why doesn't God just do the job himself, herself, and not ask for our help and things like that? So part of it is um, some mainline thinkers emphasize the social justice and try to stay away from thorny theological questions. Mm -hmm. I think some of that is justified because so much emphasis was always placed on right think versus exactly. wrong think. And what I grew up in, it's like, if you don't have the right view of God, that's the main problem as opposed to what we do and how we behave and how we love. And so I love that shift in priorities, but I wonder if, um, yeah, if there are better stories that we could be telling. So Yeah. yeah. I, and, and part of it is for um, a lot of, kind of the more mainline denominations or any of the liturgical ones, the sermons may be significantly better than the theology that is in the prayer books and the hymns. Mm. Um, and because the aesthetic and traditions and liturgical patterns of the church are language that um, developed like post-Constantine um, and such, then, you know, it still bears that. Like, it, how many as a Baptist in the South and I've awkward since I don't work there, I can't get fired. I brought this up uh, at church council meeting. I said, why do we still sing all the songs we sang in the same building when there were slaveholders? Mm. And I'm not saying you can't, I'm just saying, why did we never think about it? Is there anything that it was in it that made it okay? Um, what, why would the, the walls where there were previously, people upstairs that were chained and downstairs that weren't. And we sang these same songs in the same place. Um, and we did the, you, you see, so like part of, um, I think part of what has happened is the sheer verbosity of certain ugliness and evangelical circles uh, complaining about it has justified a lack of, self-reflection in more moderate and progressive spaces mm -hmm. of the way our uh, theology that was um, uh, has always been problematic has been harbored in different places, right? Not as gatekeeping theological statements, but as the uh, inherited liturgical shape of so much. Um, and, you know, there's a real fascinating new book that just came out uh, from Bo Underwood and... Ooh, blanking on. I didn't think we'd talk about this. Uh, they run Word and Way, which is like the ELCA, the uh, mainline Lutheran Word and Way, kind of their justice advocacy group, um, looking at the origins of Christian nationalism in America. And so much of it was a part of mainline Protestantism before the rise of uh, evangelicalism, like uh, the battle over school prayer was originally mainline Protestants. The a national prayer breakfast that was started by mainline Protestants. Um, who is it that has flags all over their sanctuary? I mean, like there are all these things in it um, that uh, that that when right, like you can look over and someone else is just more vile to you and obviously problematic. You don't question in whatever ways you're similar um, or whatever things you haven't interrogated. And as someone that uh, has served in those congregations, it it like yeah, it's better in the sense that my LGBTQ friends can come there and not feel, uh, you know, it'd be fully accepted and participate in half the clergy were gay. I that's, yeah, that's cool. Um, uh, did we try to do things around the environment and justice? Yes. Uh, but, but so much of how we understand, uh, and interpret our own experience in life and with the divine is shaped by the language and images we hold most dear. And mm -hmm. if our liturgy, uh, is of uh, an authoritarian, omnipotent God who, don't worry, loves us, uh, then that's there. And, and the other side of it in mainline Protestantism is qu a large amount of mainline Protestant theology doesn't know how to talk about a real God that does real things yep. in the world. And this is kind of after Immanuel Kant. This is the little nerdy aside that there's a whole chunks of theological schools in liberal Protestantism that uh, kind of rendered unto other parts of the world talking about God and God doing things and then took the 
the compromise of like, we'll at least order ethics and the poetry to inspire it. Um, and this is something process relational theologians have been pushing back to for years. Yep. Uh, but if the language of God, right, even within your congregation is more of just the ground of being or something, but not one that knows you, loves you and knows your enemy, loves you and calls you to serve and care for them, then the piety that comes out of it, the form of life that it it shaped, is shaped by a liturgy and laryngitis, the moment you have to talk about a living God doing things. Yep. Uh, and I think that kind of combines for uh, something that I get emails regularly about from people who listen to the podcast. They leave their evangelical church. They're like, I went to the UCC church. I went to the ELC one. I went to Presbyterian one. And I'm not, uh, they got some really weird hymns that I know none of them believe and random lines. And then I don't know if the minister actually believes in God. Right. right? And so uh, that, that plays a big role in this. What part of it it does, I don't know, but um, yeah, sorry. That was a long response. <laughs> Makes sense. I mean, I, I'm, I'm looking, I, I don't know that I've encountered a church that really has this as their kind of founding shaping. Do, 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 do you go to a church, Tom? Are you a part of a church? Yes. Oh yeah. Yeah. I'm actually still in the church of the Nazarene, which is a pretty conservative denomination. Um, they have not. Uh, declared you a heretic well they're working on it well they yeah i've gone through trials and i got another one coming up so he's got he's, another trial that is so badass i know I love you should that. totally <laughs> ask him all the things he's had heresy trials about right so but so you don't go to a church that teaches open theism or open and relational theology i go to a church in which the pastor and most of the people in it are very open to open theism they may not be able to articulate it well some of them could um but there are yeah. some like this coming in two days, Trip and I are going to be meeting in uh, a huge, um, you know, thousand plus member church in the Denver area called St. Andrews. It's a UMC church. And the pastor is explicitly processed, open, relational, written books on it. You know, he may not always <laughs> cite Whitehead in every sermon or something like that. But I mean, it's a large progressive United Methodist church in which open and relational ideas are at the center. So they exist. That's good. It's good. Hey, <laughs> and, and we're going to have beer camp there, Brian. So you'll get to visit. That's right. It's the same oh, okay. location. Okay. As That's where it's, yeah. Gotcha. 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 Very cool. Which also we got uh, Matthew oh, yeah. here. How would you suggest introducing open and relational theology from the pulpit? Well, that's one of the things we're going to be doing this week is uh, before the God after deconstruction event. Um, there's uh, an event for clergy on preaching called Persuade. So, you know, there you go. And if you, I mean, obviously it's really close. So Matthew may not be able to attend. There's a brand new book out called Preaching the Uncontrolling Love of God, Open Relational and Process Perspectives on Preaching or something like that. It's like 450 pages. Uh, so check that if you want to get, if you can't come to the conference and want some resources, get Preaching the Uncontrolling Love of God. Yeah. Well, um, you got any you got any final questions here, Brian? I I went through my list. That was my okay. list. I got all my curiosities answered. You got your curious. Well, that's what. Good, good. Um, you know, what's funny is uh, there were four of the questions that people from the group sent in were all related to like afterlife and hell and things. And so I was like scrolling through them like, oh, yeah, we talked about talked about that. Um, I know next time we'll talk more about evil and divine action stuff that there were questions about because there's whole chapters on that. But we'll we'll talk about those next time. Um, everyone that's on here, if you aren't if you haven't already got the video series, you can go grab them. Uh, just head over to uh, God after deconstruction dot com and uh, they'll be there. Um, and if you're in the group, if they're other questions you have or things came up, you can just uh, respond to any of the emails uh, and they get added to the Google Doc. And I try to find different friends to join on here that I know have interest in those. So once we got a number of afterlife hell and all that kind of stuff, things uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, Brian came over and then he started talking about it for a while. And I was like, oh, well, this will be good. And yeah, man, bring me back. We'll talk. Let's do a whole hour just on hell or something. That'd be fun. I had a lot of fun uh, chatting with you guys. Uh, I enjoyed it too, Brian. But yeah, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, 
and some of you will see later this week. I'm sure we'll record plenty of it so people will get to watch and hear things later. Um, and in the email that y'all got uh, earlier today, if you have uh, signed up, is in there's links to Brian's Instagram and such, which is very active, right? Like, you know, there's, what, there's over a hundred thousand people on your, on your account. And, uh, I, I find it helpful if you are very un, un, uh, like unaware as to how people are experiencing this round of deconstruction to follow some of these accounts, see the, especially the comments and things. And you even had, um, uh, Mark Driscoll is inspired uh, by, you yeah, know. he Mark Driscoll stitched me yesterday. The stitch means like he took one of my videos and he responded to it, and um, he didn't do a good job. I didn't think. Uh, well, I mean, it depends. Did you did he want to like let you play your stitch followed by like no God's going to send some of you to hell, so you better watch out because if he just wanted to communicate the inability to worship his image of God, he did a great job. I think he just wanted me to know that he thinks I'm going to hell. And if that's the case, well, that's that message was communicated. Dude, <laughs> the, the, the first time I met him, I you know knew we had mutual friends uh, back in the day and no one no, he hadn't really said negative things about him. I didn't know that he had like gone off the, you know, neo reformed, angry deep end. That's right. Because he started in the emergent world for like five minutes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then when he was like, we shouldn't let women talk, they were like, you can't be a part of this. Um, and so like I went in somewhere and I was, I asked a question or something, but anyway, he got so upset that he said, if I was one of his church planners, he'd get on a plane and come jump, kick me in the throat. <laughs> and I was like, what, who does this from stage with a microphone, you know? <laughs> and I thought, man, he must be in a bad mood. No, <laughs> nah. no, that's, that's he, just the vibe. He's consistent. Yeah. It's kind of a Donald Trump of. I guess evangelicalism. I don't know. Some people like they say the worst, most heinous shit, and there will always be a group of people that will follow you precisely because of that, mm. which is wild. But here we are. Yeah. <laughs> I consider it an honor to be on the opposing team. So, well, <laughs> there you go. Well, thank you all for hanging out. Thank you for joining us, Brian. Yeah, man. Thanks for having.